Okay, uh, welcome back. This is the back half of chapter one, and we want to go over a very important position that you're going to have to utilize throughout the term known as anatomical position, where the body is erect, the feet face, uh, the face is forward, the feet are together, and the palms face forward. You can see the young lady here standing in anatomical position, and it's the position against which body movements and locations of organs will be judged uh, throughout the rest of the course. So when we talk about um, movement, say, in the medial or lateral direction or the anterior or posterior direction or the superficial or deep, we're referring always uh, relative to anatomical position. So visualize yourself standing in this position when we ask questions about the locations of organs or the movements of muscles or joints. And the reason we do this is so that we have a, a common basis with which to discuss the locations of organs, uh, the presentation of diseases or particular body movements. And this is what we assume when we um, talk about, for instance, the condition of a patient or the location of a manifestation of a certain disease process. We're always uh, relating this back to anatomical position. Other body positions include supine, where we're lying with the face upward, and prone, where we're lying with the face downward. And what you can see are some directional terms on the diagram that are important to know. Superior means towards the head or the cephalic region, so you can see here the superior direction, while inferior means towards uh, the tail or away from the head. Okay, so you can see here we're heading down towards the feet. Here we're heading up towards the head in anatomical position. Medial or lateral is relative to the body's midline. So you can see the midline of the body here, this dotted line. If we move laterally, and we'll indicate that with an arrow here, um, what we're doing is we're moving away from midline. Okay. And if we're moving medially, and we'll indicate that with a green arrow, we're moving towards midline. Okay, so that's the medial in the green and lateral in the red. Superior, let's indicate that with a blue line. Okay, so this is the superior direction. And the inferior direction we'll show you with magenta. Okay, you can see here. Now, proximal versus distal is used to describe linear structures, and it's essentially distance along a limb either towards or away from the trunk. Now, you might well ask, okay, well, wait a minute here. Uh, what is the trunk of the body? And let's indicate that here in gray, okay? This is the trunk. We're circling here, okay? And as we move proximally, what we're doing is we're moving along a limb towards the trunk. You can see here with the gray arrow, that's proximal movement along the limb. The lower limb, here's proximal movement along the upper limb. And as we move distally, and let's pick cyan here, we're moving along the limb away from the trunk. Okay, so that would be the distal movement. This would be the distal movement. Okay. So very important that we understand these movements. And then superficial and deep refers to the condition of being either near the surface of the body or down towards the core of the body. So as an example, your skin would be superficial to your skeletal system. Your heart would be deep to your rib cage, just as an example of what we mean by superficial and deep. There are also um, terms that refer to the front or the back of the body, anterior or ventral towards the front, you can see here indicated, and posterior or dorsal towards the back. Okay, so you can see in the lateral view here of this gentleman in anatomical position, the posterior region, okay, indicated, posterior direction indicated here, and the anterior direction indicated here. Okay, so how could I use this in referring to some body structures? Well, let's let's try a few of these, okay? The eyebrows are superior to the eyes. 
the shoulder blades are posterior to the sternum. The ear is posterior to the eyes. The nose is medial to the eyes. The ears are lateral to the eyes. The knees are inferior to the hips. The ankles are inferior to the knees. The knees are proximal to the ankles and the hip is proximal to the knee. The shoulder is proximal to the elbow. The elbow is distal to the shoulder and is proximal to the wrist. Just as an example. And these are excellent um, sort of practice exercises that you can do so that you know you fully understand these different directional terms. And this is just table 1.2 in your book. And this is a list of the different directional terms, uh, their etymology, their definition, and examples of each one. So make sure and star this chart in your book and study it. Now if we look at a map of the body from the anterior aspect, we can see some regions that we want to become familiar with in a general sense. So let's start at the top and work our way down. The head region, or the cephalic region, is made up of the frontal region, which is the forehead, the orbital region, which contains the eyes, the nasal region, the nose, and of course the oral region where the mouth is. The otic region is the location of the ears, the buccal, the cheeks. The mental is the chin, okay, often referred to uh, for instance as the mandible. And then down here we can look at the thoracic region which contains the pectoral region which are these areas that are lateral to the breastbone or sternum. The sternal region of course which is where that bone is located right underneath the sternum is the thymus and underneath that is the heart. So using our terminology we could say that the sternum is superficial to the thymus and the heart and the thymus is deep to the sternum and superficial to the heart. And then there's the mammary region which is where the breasts are located. The axillary region is the area of the underarm, the brachial region, the arm, the antecubital region, the area in front of the elbow, the antebrachial region, the forearm, the carpal region, the wrist, the palmar region, the palm, and the digital region where the fingers is and of course the thumb is known as the pollex. Moving down into the abdominal region we can see here uh, again the different areas of the abdominal region if we were to to divide it as we'll see or as we've already seen uh, into a tic-tac-toe grid right we would have the four quadrants we would have here the uh, left upper quadrant or LUQ the left lower quadrant or LLQ the right upper quadrant or RUQ and the right lower quadrant or RLQ Within the abdominal region, um, you've also got the umbilical region. Okay, we already know the uh, hypochondriac regions. If you divide the um, abdominal region into up into a tic-tac-toe grid, you've got the uh, the uh, hypochondriac regions. You've got the epigastric, the hypogastric, and uh, the umbilical region. And then down here, of course, you've got the lumbars. Okay, so that's another way to divide up the abdominal pelvic region. And then of course here we have the pelvis, the inguinal or groin region, and then the pubic region, which is where the genitals actually lie. Uh, moving down, uh, you can see the coxal or the hip region. Below that, the femoral region, the patellar region, the kneecap, the curl region, which is what you think of as the lower leg, the talus, which is essentially where the ankle is, the dorsum, which is the top of the foot, and the digital region, which are the toes. Now you might think, well gee, that's a lot of stuff to memorize, and is it going to do me any good? Well, let me give you a, an example of where this comes in very, very handy. Okay, Let's look, for instance, at the upper leg. Okay, So this is the femoral region. Now, you'll learn when we get to the skeletal system that the major bone of the upper leg is called the femur. It articulates with the coxal region. The bone of the hip is known as the os coxa. And 
when we learn about the circulatory system, you'll find that the major artery that runs through this region is known as the femoral artery, and a major vein running through this region is the femoral vein. A major nerve running through this region is the femoral nerve. Okay, so just as an example of why it's useful to learn these body locations because they give names to a lot of the structures that are going to crop up as we go through the different body systems. If we look at this individual from the back, okay, you can see the cranial region back here, the back of the head, the skull, the occipital region, which is the base of the skull, the nuchal region, which is the back of the neck, the scapular region, which you think of as your shoulder blades, the acromial region, which is the shoulder joint, the vertebral region, which is where the spinal cord and the vertebral column are located, the lumbar region, which is down here in the lower back, okay, and all these make up the dorsal aspect of the trunk. Moving down, you can see the gluteal region, the buttocks, the perineal region, uh, which is essentially where the, uh, the anal opening and the genitals can be seen from the back. Uh, you can pick up the dorsum of the hand, just like there's a dorsum of the foot, there's the dorsum of the hand. The olecranon region, which is the elbow joint, the acromial region that we touched on already. When we look at the front of the individual. The popliteal region, which is the area behind the knee. The sural region, which is the calf. calf the plantar region, which is the sole of the foot, and the calcaneus, which is the heel bone. Okay, so here again, um, to show you why this is useful, uh, if we look at the back of the knee, one of the major arteries that runs through here is the popliteal artery, one of the major veins is the popliteal vein, and one of the major nerves is the popliteal nerve. Okay, so if you learn these body locations, it'll go a long way towards helping you learn the other structures that are underneath it. Okay, we're just learning here surface anatomy, but it applies to deeper structures as well. Now you can divide the abdominal pelvic cavity, as we mentioned earlier, into um, some different regions. You can split it into a four square grid. You can see here the right upper and left upper quadrant and the right and left lower quadrants. Um, notice again that different organs are located uh, in different quadrants. In the right upper you can see lots of the liver, parts of the ascending and transverse colon and portions of the small intestine. In the left upper you can see portions of the liver, portions of the stomach, transverse colon, descending colon, and portions of the small intestine. The left lower quadrant contains portions of the descending and sigmoid colon, portions of the small intestine, the bit of the bladder as well. Um, the ureters are also back here. Uh, over here, the right lower quadrant, you can see the cecum, the appendix, portions of the small intestine, portions of the bladder. Now, why is this useful? This is useful because you can indicate if a patient presents with a particular problem um, exactly, in, in a relatively specific sense, where the pain or, or where the unusual finding might be. For instance, very often, um, people with appendicitis will present with extreme pain at an area called McBurney's Point, which is two-thirds of the way between the navel and the crest of the ilium, and that can indicate now an inflamed vermiform appendix, which is a tiny blind sac that comes off the base of the cecum that can sometimes become plugged with fecal material and bacteria, which can then inflame and swell and the potential for it to burst means that this is a medical emergency and so if you present with extreme pain at McBurney's point along with other symptoms that seem to indicate appendicitis we need to get you to the emergency room as rapidly as possible. You can also divide the abdominal pelvic region into a tic-tac-toe grid. You can see here the right and left hypochondriac regions so named because of their location under the chondral cartilages which connect the ribs to the sternum. You can see the epigastric region which is above the stomach. Down here the right and left lumbar regions, areas in the lower back, the umbilical region which contains the navel. The right and left iliac regions so named for their proximity to a bone known as the ilium which is a portion of the os coxa that has three 
um, broad regions in it representing a single fused bone, the ilium, the ischium, and the pubis. And then, of course, the hypogastric region, so named because it lies beneath the stomach, the stomach being up here, the hypogastric region being down here. Now, there are also planes that we can pass through the body that allow us to visualize internal organs. Um, if you were an anatomist working on a cadaver, you might cut these bodies into different planes in order to examine the organs and the internal structures. But the utility of these planes in modern medicine is to use methods of visualizing internal structures in the body um, using techniques such as CT scan or X-ray or um, MRI in order to get a look at internal structures by making some of these different cuts through the body and examining gross morphological problems with the organ, for instance. Uh, you might see uh, a, a leakage or a mass uh, as an example of something being wrong uh, with the person internally. So let's review some of these sections. A medial section is right through the midline, also known as a, as a sagittal section, and you can see the plane here, and what it does is it cuts the body into right and left halves, while the frontal or coronal plane, which you can see here, divides you into front and back halves, and a transverse or cross section will divide you into a top and a bottom, this being the transverse plane here. That being said, um, you can also cut at an angle that's intermediate between any of these planes, and this would be an oblique section. And again, um, knowing where the oblique section was made, uh, the anatomist or the clinician or the doctor can uh, have a reasonable uh, confidence that they're going to see certain structures in certain orientations. And if we see something that shouldn't be there, or if we see the structure... Um, presenting with a condition that we wouldn't anticipate in a normal individual, then we can assume that there's some sort of disease process going on and we need treatment. Here you can see examples of some of these sections through the body. This is a, a sagittal section through the cephalic and the cervical region. Down here you can see a transverse section made at uh, the abdominal region. And down here, you can see a coronal section made through the pelvic region. And here you can see the femur, the head of the femur, uh, where it articulates with the os coxa in a, in a indentation known as the acetabulum. Uh, and you can see some of the other associated structures. All, this, all these um, pictures, a lot of the pictures that you're going to see in your book, are made using a variety of internal imaging techniques that weren't possible just a few decades ago um, up until that point um, before these advanced imaging techniques came along the only way that we could um, figure out what might be wrong with internal organs or internal uh, organ function uh, was a, a technique um, along with diagnosis that was called exploratory surgery where we'd actually have to open up the individual and look at the organs and see if we can observe anything wrong directly, but today with these imaging techniques that we'll discuss in a bit, um, we can actually reconstruct an entire three-dimensional picture of the internal structures of the human body without ever having to, um, to cut you open at all. And what this does is this, number one, aids diagnosis tremendously, and if surgery um, ends up being a recommended course of treatment, it allows us to reduce the trauma that's associated with surgical intervention um, in order to fix an internal problem. We can also take planes through an organ. A longitudinal cut will run along the length of an organ, while a transverse cut will run at a right angle to the organ, and an oblique cut will be any angle other than a right angle. And you can see, for instance, this is a, a piece of small intestine here, how these different um, cuts look on, on, a, on a slide. This is something that you might very well see in lab when we're looking at tissues and we take thin sections. Um, very often it's, it's not possible to get um, every structure as either a perfect longitudinal or transverse cut. Sometimes you'll see a mixture of oblique and transverse and longitudinal cuts. Um, within a single slide. And so you have to understand uh, what you're looking at 
after it's been stained and mounted and you're observing it under the microscope so you can see what these different cuts look like in this particular slide. Now there's some other body cavities that we want to touch on. Um, we've talked about the thoracic and abdominal pelvic cavities and the fact that they're divided by the main muscle of breathing known as the diaphragm which sits at the base of the lungs and is responsible for ventilating the lungs through its contraction it actually produces a vacuum around the lungs inside the thoracic cavity which is transferred to the lungs and if the nose and the mouth are open the air will rush in and then when the diaphragm relaxes it goes back to this domed shape producing a positive pressure around the outside of the lungs that forces the air out but it is a major dividing line it splits the body cavity into thoracic and abdominal pelvic regions and within the thoracic region we have a cavity known as the mediastinum that contains all the structures of the thoracic cavity except for the lungs and so that would include the heart, the great vessels, the esophagus, the trachea, um, it, all the organs that we would expect to see basically a thoracic midline. Okay, and so you can see the mediastinum essentially here. The lungs sit in the pleural cavities inside the thoracic cavity. Notice that there's a right and a left pleural cavity. Um, and remember also that all of these cavities are lined with a membrane these cover the organs of the trunk cavities and they line it. If we imagine in this diagram that the fist represents an organ, the inner balloon wall will represent the visceral serous membrane, while the outer balloon wall would represent the parietal serous membrane, and the cavity between them will be filled with a lubricating serous fluid that's produced by these membranes. And you might think, well, um, what's the purpose of that? And it's to prevent inflammation. I know it's kind of strange to think about, but your, your internal organs are always in motion. Generally, almost every organ in your body <coughs> has some degree of movement associated with it. And if we didn't lubricate the organ, what would happen over time is it would irritate, inflame, and scar. It would damage the organ. That would compromise its function. That would eventually lead to disease. If we look at... <coughs> some of these serous membranes. The pericardial um, membrane refers to the heart. The pleural membranes refer to the lungs and the thoracic cavity. And the peritoneum refers to the abdominal pelvic cavity. Now, in addition to producing a serous fluid, we also need to understand that these membranes are highly vascularized, meaning they have a lot of blood vessels in them. Uh, also, nerves and lymphatics run through a lot of these membranes as well. So not, they not only <coughs> serve to lubricate the organ, um, they do have some role in maintaining its location inside the body cavity. They also provide roots for sensation and for, of course, a blood supply, as well as a method of um, filtering the interstitial fluid, which is the fluid between the tissues um, that is eventually um, uh, moved to the lymphatic system where we can check for the presence of pathogens. So more than one role um, is carried out by these serous membranes. So let's take a look at the pleural membranes here. Okay, now, last thing I want to talk about in Chapter 1 are some imaging techniques that we've um, been able to perfect over the past several decades that have allowed uh, surgical procedures and diagnoses um, to become much more accurate, much more efficient, and um, for the treatments to um, be much less traumatic to the individual who's um, under the physician's care. These include radiography, ultrasound, computed tomography, dynamic spatial reconstruction, digital subtraction and geography, magnetic resonance imaging, and positron emission tomography. So let's take a look at what each of these um, techniques looks like. This is, a radi this is an x-ray or a radiography, and 
essentially um, radio opaque tissues, dense tissues, do not allow x-rays to pass through them while um, tissues that are not nearly as radio opaque will allow these high energy um, emissions of electromagnetic radiation to pass through and what it does is it exposes photographic film on the other side of the specimen if the film is exposed what will happen is it will turn uh, white or, or gray depending on the degree of exposure unexposed film will remain black so this is an extremely short wave form of electromagnetic radiation it's actually a form of radiation known as ionizing radiation because when it hits molecules in living systems it actually can form ions and damage living tissue that way it moves through the body and exposes a photographic plate to form a radiograph bones and radio opaque dyes will absorb the rays and create underexposed areas that look white on the photographic film um, and again the areas that are not radio opaque will show up dark we use these um, radiography techniques to visualize uh, broken bones or to check for a cavity in a tooth um, a major limitation of radiographs is that they give a two-dimensional image of the body where sometimes a three-dimensional image is preferred with that said ultrasound is a computer um, analysis that can generate a surface three-dimensional um, map of the body essentially sound waves are bounced off the body and it allows us to get some idea of its general shape it's the second oldest imaging technique developed in the 50s as an extension of World War II sonar technology and it uses high frequency sound that comes from a transmitter receiver that's placed over the skin or the area that we're scanning the waves strike internal organs or internal structures and they bounce back to a receiver on the skin um, this is a relatively non-invasive technique the most important advances in the field uh, occurred only after it became possible to analyze the reflected waves on a computer and what it was able to do is generate now a, a visual image of what we're actually capturing in the sound waves. Um, this allows us to um, visualize surface structures of living tissue in real time uh, which is very useful. We also should point out that it's one of the least damaging of the imaging techniques because it's the lowest um, lowest energy content waveform that we use to examine these internal structures, these sound waves that bounce off. Okay, computed te tomography or CT scan is um, essentially a computer analyzed composite of many radiographs and it can show slices of the body. It can also be used to reconstruct three-dimensional images of the body. It was developed in the early 70s and was originally called axial tomographic can scans or CAT scans. Um, these are computer analyzed x-ray images. Basically a low intensity x-ray tube is rotated through a circular arc around the patient and the images are fed into the computer which reconstructs the slice through the body at the point where the x-ray beam was focused and rotated. These slices can be used to regenerate an entire three-dimensional image of the body in some cases. Um, and this allows us to look at internal structures almost as if we had actually opened you up surgically. So you can see an example here of a 2D slice and a 3D reconstruction through here um, the cranial region and here the uh, cephalic and cervical region. This dynamic spatial reconstruction um, uses these multiple slices. It takes very powerful computers in order to generate these images but again it obviates the need of um, exploratory surgery for exploratory surgery okay digital subtraction angiography or DSA um, is a step beyond CT scanning here a 3D radiographic image of an organ such as a brain is made and stored in the computer and then a radio opaque dye is injected into the blood and this allows us to visualize the vessels that run through the organ so this allows the second radiographic computer image to be overlaid on the first. Um, the first image is then subtracted from the second one, and this greatly enhances the differences revealed by the dye. These dynamic computer images can be used to guide a catheter to a carotid artery during an angioplasty, 
which is a procedure where a tiny balloon is inflated inside the vessel in order to um, alleviate the block that's coming from uh, sclerotic material that could potentially clog the artery. Just as one example, um, we can also use it to uh, look for vascular displacement in people that have, say, um, cerebral hemorrhage. Um, it can be used to visualize um, problems in the lower extremities. Uh, for instance, if we worry uh, about, say, deep vein thrombosis or some other type of problem with clotting, uh, we can use this type of angiography as well. Magnetic resonance imaging is, some, is a technique that probably a lot of you have heard of, and it uses magnetism and radio waves to look for the alignment of protons in soft tissue. So what happens here is that radio waves are directed at a person lying inside a large EM field. The magnetic field causes protons of various atoms to align. Because there's a lot of water in the body, the alignment of these hydrogen atom protons is important uh, in allowing us to look at soft tissue here. Radio waves of certain frequencies change the alignment of these atoms, which are then directed at the patient. The radio waves are then turned off, and the hydrogen atoms realign with the magnetic field. The time it takes the hydrogen atoms to realign is different for different body tissues, and these differences are analyzed by the computer, and this produces these, these sections through the body where we can actually see details of soft tissue. Uh, it's very sensitive in detecting certain forms of cancer more readily than a CT scan, and another advantage, of course, of this type of um, analysis is that the type of energy we use is a lot less damaging than something like an x-ray. Now PET scan uses radioactively labeled glucose to calculate metabolic activity within cells. Essentially what we do here is we feed living tissue radioactive um, fuel and we allow metabolism to take place. Um, and what this does is lets us um, analyze on the fly the metabolic states of different tissues. Uh, we can use it in the brain. Shown here is a PET scan of the cranial region uh, where this would be the anterior, this would be the posterior aspect. Uh, the energy they need is supplied by the breakdown of glucose. If it's been radioactively labeled, the active cells will take up the hot glucose and as the radioactive glucose decays, the positively charged subatomic particles known as positrons will hit electrons that are in the soft tissue and when they do they produce energy that can be picked up on a computer monitor and so what you're looking at here for instance in this image the areas that are red are very metabolically active and the areas that are in blue or green not so much okay again comparatively but again this is another way this is one of the few ways actually um, to visualize the the living tissue of the brain um, as it's processing um, stimuli and generating commands uh, without having to actually uh, look at the brain itself surgically. Okay, so this is one of the few um, methods that we have to get into the black box known as the, uh, as the human brain. And so what you're looking at here is just a summary of each of these techniques. This is um, table, I believe it's... Uh, I think it's 1-1 one, one or 2-1 in your book, and it talks about each of these imaging techniques in detail, gives you, gives, you, gives you examples of each one. So you can see here x-ray, ultrasound, um, CT, um, angiography, down here MRI, and then at the bottom here PET scan. So um, make sure, and um, when you're listening to this podcast, uh, use it to reconstruct your notes. And keep in mind that we will be testing over this material in class. So uh, be ready with your PRS clickers in the event that we have a couple of questions on this type of uh, imaging technique. If it comes up, you're ready for it. And I will see everybody in class. Thank you so much.